you seem to have this special connection with Nuguma, mm. obviously a lineage holder of the Shangpa Kagyu. Mm. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, who is Nuguma, mm. sort of your sort of connection and feeling towards Nuguma, mm. and then <coughs> since we're going to move into seeing a little bit of the yoga practice, mm. um, a little bit about what is Nuguma's yoga. Mm. Um, regarding the Nuguma, there's not so much known about her. Mm. Um, the only thing that is known about her is that she is a highly realized being, equal to green Tara and the white Tara, that sort of a level of realization being. That's number one. Number two is that she is the elder sister of Naropa. Mm. So Naropa, of course, followed the Telopa, mm. and the Niguma, she followed Saraha, and then eventually she declared, she said, I have no human guru. Mm. I have only one guru, and that is the Buddha himself, the Vajadara himself, that has uh, uh, come to my presence. Uh, so that is her declaration in terms of the level of realization that she had. That's the, uh, that's the origin of that. And the third is that her lifestyle. Uh, she is known as a Kandroma, but many people in nowadays, when they think about the Kandroma, they think it's something to do with the consort. You know? mm. And that is a wrong misunderstanding. Uh, because being a Kandroma has nothing to do with being a consort. Uh, it's, not, it's about being, you know, being Kandroma, Dhaka, Dakini, all these are highly realized beings, mm -hmm. less dependent, non-attached, uh, highly realized yogi and Mahasiddha, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So she lived uh, very much in the wild, and when she met Chungpo Nanjo, and uh, Chungpo Nanjo was uh, directed to that forest because of the other great masters in Bodhigaya at that time. And when they first met, and then Yuguma said, uh, what are you doing here? I'm a cannibalist. I'm going to eat you alive. Yeah. And my friends are going to come. They're going to definitely eat you alive. So you should run away. Mm. So definitely, uh, it shows that she's not uh, hair brushing every day, <laughs> doing makeup every day. You know, and Definitely, she's not in that... Uh, yoga pant <laughs> or, <laughs> or anything like that. She is definitely living just like a many other great Mahasiddha yeah. uh, and the great yogi, a little bit like a solitude life and also in a cremation site as well where people don't bother to come yeah. in the wild forest. Uh, and my relation to the Niguma is, of course, it goes all the way back to uh, previous Kalurambuche and the previous Kalurambuche with the previous Kalurambuche and then goes all the way back to the, uh, the first Jangan Kondolor Taye and the Taranata and all that teachings and the transmission that is passed down uh, to me over the time. So that is my relation in terms of the, the empowerment. Mm. But uh, from my heart, connection was in the retreat. Mm. When I read the biography, when I actually practiced, that was the time that I told myself I'm going to uphold this lineage and bring it back alive and make it, uh, you know, how do I say, maintain as it should, mm. uh, as a one of the Buddhist branch in terms of the lineage and the practice and the yoga. And so, mm. so that's that. Very nice. Thank you, Wenke. You're welcome. And, um, and you said in retreat you had a sort of, you know, that those practices came easy for you in a way compared to other practices, right? Yes, yes, yes. Practices. So there's some connection. Yes, I basically became a nationalist uh, right wing. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the biography, but uh, all the other practice that I uh, did in the Niguma, especially I like very much her teachings, mm. because the way she expressed her teaching is so much loving, so much caring, almost knowing that you are going to read that. You know, that sense of presence. Because there's so many other different figures who just write things. There's no sense of personality in it. There's no sense of heart-to-heart -heart connection to it. It's like, okay, you do this, you do that. After that, three times of this, you do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of guideline, but lack of human bond. So when I read the Niguma's teaching, there's a human bond mm. from her to her student. And when I s reflect that, 
you know, in terms of her quality and realization, but also her character, you know, and that made me, uh, you know, very much uh, uh, cherish the teachings of the Niguma. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, of course, based on that and all the other practice that I do, based on the Niguma's teaching, it was relatively easy, and I'm, I'm very fortunate for that. Mm -hmm. So one last question, Rinpoche. Often these teachings are considered very secret. Mm -hmm. and so I was wondering like, uh, how you think about secrecy. What is the role of secrecy? Vajrayana is often associated with you know, the secret teachings. Mm -hmm. So what does secrecy mean in terms of Vajrayana in this, this context? I mean, you can search on the internet. There's nothing much secret left. <laughs> yeah. You can say, I'm going to keep a secret, but there's nothing much left. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, Niguma herself, uh, she mentioned, she said, my lineage, my five jewels of Niguma's teaching, and the six yogas of Niguma should kept secret until the seventh generation. That includes her. She said, you have to keep the secret until the seventh generation. After the seventh generation, then the seventh lineage holder is permitted to give to the public. You know, whether it's the five jewels of Niguma, whether it's all the teachings. And so that's, that is the historical origin. Due to that, like an example, the second Dalai Lama, His Holiness Dalai Lama, was born in the Shambhagaji family. Mm -hmm. And his father was a retreat master overseeing the small temples and the retreat centers and so on. As he reached the teenager age, he was already influenced by his father. And then he was recognized as a reincarnation of Dalai Lama. Mm. So that has the influence on the Gilupa lineage as well. Mm. And then also during the seventh, after the seventh lineage holder, and there was also a time where, uh, how do you call it, uh, Chanang lineage, like an example, Taranatha, revived many, many teachings because many teachings are based on the, mm, how do you call it, memorizing. We call it a nyenju. Nyenju means I memorize everything and then I say it to your ears. I don't say it to anybody. You memorize everything and then, and then I pass it to the next one. Mm. So it's called nyenju. So it was not just a singular lineage that was not allowed to make it public, but it was also an ear to you know, ear uh, lineage. And then by the time of Taranatha and due to the size of the Tibet geography, you know, many teachings were about to go extinct because people don't have a social media platform, right? <laughs> so you have to be a little bit wealthy to receive Dharma. You can't uh, say that I have a pure heart. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to look after your own survival. You, know, you need to go for a very hard journey. You, you can't take a sky train. There's no metro. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that, all that possibility. And then on the top of that lineage to maintain, it's almost like a two impossible tasks com combining together. Mm -hmm. One is people coming together is already challenging. And when the teaching is like ear to ear lineage, ninju, mm -hmm. and then that is like the perfect scenario for lineage to disappear. Mm -hmm. And then so what Taranatha did was that he uh, revived many teachings, many practice, uh, so due to him. <coughs> So he wrote these down. Yeah, he name. wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And then also, like an example, the concept of the three years retreat, uh, nowadays we know it, it's relatively new. Mm -hmm. It's not ancient as we think. And the concept of three years retreat, one monastery start to do it, the other monastery copy it. Mm -hmm. Like an example, you see the one rooftop looks similar, looks nice, okay, mm -hmm. the next one does it similar to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore, there, there became a trend. And that the concept of three years retreat, okay, this lineage is doing like that, that lineage is doing like this. Because if you look back in a, in a biography of Milarepa, there's no mention of so-called three years retreat. There's a lifetime retreat, yeah. you know, which is far more mm -hmm. than a retreat. Uh, so we have to understand that, oh, some practice is only allowed in the retreat. Yes, that is made up mm -hmm. in the recent generation. But prior to that, before that, there's a many... Because otherwise, all the teaching wouldn't spread. Mm. You know, because it wouldn't spread to the Gelupa school, it wouldn't spread to the Kajupa school, it wouldn't spread to the Chonang school, it wouldn't spread anywhere. Mm. 
you know. So, so that's that. Yeah. And my main purpose is to uh, bring people to Dharma for physical and the mental well-being, not just giving an impression of, oh, this is a Rinpoche sitting on the high throne. He has the object in his hand. Get a blessing. Mm -hmm. Go back to your home. You know, that impression is good, you know, if we have a culture mentality. But many people who are engaged in Buddhism, we, they don't have a culture background. Mm -hmm. So what they need is they need to have this, some form of, uh, they need to taste the flavor of what is the meaning of being a Buddhist and the Dharma practitioner. How, what can you feel within your body and mind? What is the difference before and after? You know? So if they can feel that, do that, right? And then there's no doubt that they will learn further Buddha's teaching, whether whichever the tradition may be. You know, it doesn't mean that they have to stick with me yeah. and me only. You know, so, so that's that. Thank you, Mumjay. Very you're, clear. You're welcome.